My name is Zeke Jones, I'm a Master's of Architecture student, and with me today is Casey Breen. Um, he's currently the uh, Master's of Science Architectural Technologies Coordinator at SciArc. Um, he is the founder, uh, co-founder of Ishida Reem, and he is also a uh, founder of Kinch, which was founded in 2011. Mm -hmm. Thank you for being with us. Um, so, if you wouldn't mind uh, maybe talking about your architectural education briefly, and uh, what drew you to the computa computational side of design. Sure. Um, and maybe how, how computation has changed from when you first started to uh, where it is now. Sure. Um, so uh, I started out actually majoring in psych and zoology in undergrad, and I, I transferred into architecture after a couple of years. Um, and kind of weirdly, that's, that, that period of time when I was doing the, the psych coursework and curriculum for that, that kind of double major is when I was first introduced to a lot of the concepts that I use now in my computation. So it felt a little bit at the time like a, a dead end for my education, but it paid out in the long run. Um, the, then I went to uh, Carnegie Mellon for undergrad, uh, moved to Los Angeles after that, uh, worked for several years uh, in LA and then also in Berlin. Um, then I went back to grad school at, at Columbia and about, uh, graduated there in 2009. Um, and at that point, like I, I had already started doing the computational design. Uh, back in 2003, I went to a lecture by Jeffrey Kipnis on the Mood River exhibition in Columbus, Ohio. Um, and he was talking about, um, they used the kind of um, analog of uh, self-organized swarm or, or, or flock for the way they, they thought about curating that exhibition as, and as a, kind of like as a way of representing the way certain features in design projects get kind of promoted throughout the field of design. Like showing how like this toothbrush got the little blue rubber thing. The next like couple months, every other toothbrush brand has, has like the little blue rubber thing. Mm -hmm. Um, but that got me obsessed with uh, basically intelligent agent computation. So I started that really back in about 2003 um, at, at Columbia kind of serendipitously because I, the, you know, the way the people that I thought I would be going to learn from at Columbia no longer taught there, but other people were there. Um, I started to uh, work with uh, Roland Snooks, who uh, at the time was a partner of Kukuja with uh, Rob Stewart Smith. And, um, you know, they were also invested in this intelligent agent stuff uh, with a slightly more emphasis on kind of biomimetic um, computation, whereas my work had been more looking at different types of intelligence relative to spe specific characteristics of the kind of agents, bodies, or figures. Um, then for a couple of years, like, I don't know if you guys know this, there was like a, a crisis in 2009, mm -hmm. like a great recession, right? Mm -hmm. So it turns out that um, even though I had been at that point uh, a project designer level architect with, you know, um, some significant professional experience, the, when people don't have money, they stop building buildings. That's kind of the general trend. So I had to diversify um, what I was doing professionally in order to just kind of make ends meet. And I started to work on this really diverse range of projects from uh, like to doing things like mapping and visualizing the, the subway system from kind of real time, real world data in New York of like ridership, like with people Swiping it out, we built a 40-foot-long map for a, an exhibition for the Audi Experiments in Motion project. Um, I was doing some stuff I can't talk about that was had nothing to do with architecture. It's more data viz for companies doing big data. Mm -hmm. um, and I was also consulting for Cecil Bauman at the time as his personal algorithmic consultant when he was still um, running the AGU at Arup back in the day. So I was all over the place, and like kind of between all of that, I was able to make a living that kept me in New York, which most of my classmates uh, didn't do. Um, but yeah, that kind of set the framework for everything else. Um, uh, worked for a while. After a couple years, I ended up working with Kakuja as their first kind of proper um, kind of person that already had some professional experience on the staff. Uh, we, we made a go of it for a while. Um, it kind of fell apart a little bit just because of the, the kind of strains of still, like you know, the recession was still running. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and then I started teaching at that point. Around 2011, I started teaching. Okay, and that's also when you founded your practice? Yeah, actually, Kinch started way earlier than that. I'm not, okay. I don't know why I sent you guys that number. It actually started, um, I started doing stuff under that name right after undergrad, like for consulting and things okay. on computational stuff, okay, mostly, so yeah. Uh, no, oh, like 04? 04, oh, okay. Yeah, I'm old. <laughs> <laughs> 
Yeah. Okay, so so Kinch started, and mm -hmm. um, what was your first project with Kinch? Or was that where you were sort of doing the? Consulting? Well, initially it was just consulting. Yeah. Okay. Um, we so and then there was a series of like like after like around pretty much around 2009 I started to get like more exhibitions or like media work for myself. Um, I did I started a series of collaborations a couple of years after that uh, with a Japanese photographer um, doing some kind of um, kind of digital media uh, pieces with her uh, that we exhibited around a lot. Um, yeah, I still kind of shilled a bit for um, other offices helping them out with some computational stuff. I didn't really stop doing that work until about four or five years ago. Okay. Kind of my, when I moved to LA to begin teaching at SIRC is when I, I um, stopped consulting for other practices and focused more on the building up Kinch as its own kind of design um, studio. Okay, mm -hmm. and so when that happened, um, could you walk us through that process of sort of building the firm and having your projects outside of consulting? Are you uh, interested in learning how to not make money? Because <laughs> yeah. like Kinch has been like, is a wildly unprofitable, and, and the Shida Reem Studio is too, to a point. Like at this point, we're just kind of breaking even. Um, I don't know. I think probably I'm the last person to ask about that. I have um, stumbled from project to project again because we had the, this kind of diverse, wide net of what we can do from from like interactive media software to um, robotics to um, architectural design. Um, we can do a lot of different things. Right now we're trying to piece things together and uh, uh, between that and the teaching has kind of allowed it to continue. Mm -hmm. um, but there's a, there's a focus right now in the, in the office with, uh, with the Asushi Yoshida to um, commit more towards the actual turning it into a proper architectural practice, like starting to um, reduce those other types of contracts and things. Because one thing that's happened in the last like two years as I, I kind of slowly creeping in on 40 this May, mm -hmm. I can't do as much stuff. Right. My bandwidth got narrower. Like, right. I, like I'm, I like can't handle like um, effectively covering the same range of stuff that I used to cover. And so what we're trying to do now is just kind of like focus on what's critical to us, which um, is largely the kind of architectural design side. Um, so we are also at this moment, you know, both of us, uh, Yusushi has a very long professional career working for some great offices over the years, um, like Morphosis, Itoshi Abe, we actually met working together at Michael Maltzen's office. Mm -hmm. And we have a lot of, um, between the two of us, we have a lot of skill sets to cover a lot of the practice. But the thing we, we're both bad at is business mm -hmm. and marketing. So this is, this, is, this is our new challenge is to kind of figure that out. Seems to be the case with most architecture firms. That yeah. Those are the two areas that are a bit lacking, mm -hmm. even though we take all the classes seems to quickly escape our brains. Yeah, I mean, we're I'm, with the new program that we're starting at uh, SIRC, um, we're not, it's not a new program. We're kind of um, reconfiguring an existing post-professional on architecture and technology. And in Los Angeles is a perfect city to be in for this territory. Like, it's a lot of the uh, tech firms have moved offices down there. Um, there's a lot of industry down there. There's a lot of venture capitalism down there. So we're looking to begin to find ways of partnering with um, some people in that that VC area that could maybe te like you know become consultants on the students' projects as they're developing their research projects with an aim that when they graduate they'll have like a business plan and maybe they can teach me too while they're doing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, so so to speak to that, how uh, has your practice coincided with teaching? Do you ever use uh, say studio material as a I mean, I think inevitably your interests uh, from your practice will mm -hmm. bleed over. So, so could you explain how those have, um, maybe how, how you thought about that and how maybe that will adapt to the fact that you're now going to focus more on architectural projects or maybe that doesn't apply at all? I mean, I wouldn't say that those are directly related. I, I think, um, you know, I have a lot of architectural experience. Um, so in my studios at SIRC, like it's always been focused on that. Um, and even, at, even when Kinch was, you know, all the money I was making was from the, the media stuff mostly and the software stuff, but we were still doing competitions and architectural projects. Um, we just weren't relying on that for income. And even though like, we're technically not doing that anymore, we're, we're still doing that. Like, it's the, it pays the bills for the interns in the office. Right. So on the one hand, I, I wouldn't say that like, we're going to be pivoting to more architectural focus in studio because I think that's already always been there, okay. um, a big commitment. Um, for me, like, I mean, that's actual territory I'm interested in. Um, the, the kind of media art stuff really came out of desperation in 2009 to 
pay bills. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. Yeah. So that being said, like uh, you gave the, this lecture that I watched um, earlier, and it was I think is an aeronautics conference, and you're talking about surveillance. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. Uh, and so is that stuff? So you, that's maybe you're you're shifting away from that. Interest. No, that's all integrated. Like okay. our the, our architectural projects are directly related to the kind of research we're doing about contemporary technology and society. Okay. I don't think it makes sense right now to ignore these kind of extant realities in the way that we live, the way that we operate, the way we consume, the way we inhabit things um, in developing a, a project. Like I get super concerned when there's a, you know, when we talk about the kind of discipline of architecture versus the practice, I dislike that distinction. Mm -hmm. And I also strongly dislike when the discipline seems to like create a distance between itself and the kind of contemporary realities of, of society. Okay. Yeah. So that's so the weird surveillance stuff is very much a part of the way that um, that we still are thinking about the space. And I, I you know, the the way we're we're very focused on this idea of a kind of interfaced architecture or an architecture driven by interfacial relationships. And some of that stuff is tech, like um, like literally um, surveillance cameras and things. Other stuff, um, you know, interface is not a new idea in architecture. Like uh, you know. Like doors or interfaces between the inside and outside, like you know, yeah. but like kind of looking at architecture from that perspective, like kind of de-emphasizing um, overall forms or figures, de-emphasizing kind of clarity of, of diagram mm -hmm. or things that used to be very critical to architectural discourse, like you know, like um, those uh, those ranger guys that used to be here, right? Like oh, yeah. they have some yeah, yeah. very clear uh, didactic diagrams on on planning. Uh -huh. Um, and emphasizing more about understanding the sequence of relationships between those moments of interface in architecture, both kind of digitally and physically. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so when you speak about architecture, it's not necessarily a physical manifestation of any, anything. It might be a digital manifestation in a physical space. I think there could be an argument for that. Um, I think for us, like they're not, they're mostly inseparable. Like the types of algorithms that I work with almost exclusively are um, forms of intelligent agency which are designed to respond to external things. Okay. So there, there's always this dialogue between their environment and themselves. I think okay. rather than maybe the generation above me of like, you know, Kukuja and certainly the generation above them with like guys like Carl Chu, um, Alyssa Andrasek, which kind of viewed these simulations as things that happened in a black box that then got put out in the world. Like all of my machines are like designed around kind of um, engaging like real world data, kind of actually Starting that idea with me kind of started with the um, the project I did for the the subway that I mentioned before. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's like how do you begin to inhabit the world with these things? Um, I mean, that's the kind of real value of, of AI is like kind of consuming banal data and doing something interesting with it. Right. Yeah. Right. I really liked the, the gender bending. Yeah. The CCTV. I, I, did that, I did that like in a day. Yeah, that's what you said. And um, I'm, I'm going to keep showing it because everyone likes it. So it's like my crowd pleaser. I, I, really need, I really need to do it over. It's really old and outdated at this point. Like I think I could do like a proper deep fake if I just spent a little really? bit of time on it. Yeah. A hundred percent. I know I could. It's just like the kind of the old trashy version uh -huh. kind of looks better somehow. I to like me. it. Yeah. Yeah. It has like that cloud around your face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's yeah. totally messed up. So, <laughs> like sometimes when I do the, the the neural net stuff, particularly within the like the this exhibition, also was kind of around similar time to that when I did that one. The software I made that I used to make this one um, was about kind of this like idea about a deep fake architecture, like a, a deep fake urbanism. Although I didn't that uh, term hadn't really come out yet, so I was just calling it like hoax urbanism. Okay. Um, but it. Like some of them got too good. Like some of the, particularly like the satellite view city plans. When I would like uh, you know hang them in a gallery and it, like they're kind of big 80 inch drawings, mm -hmm. um, people would be like, "Why are you, you know, screenshotting Google Earth?" And it's, right. like, it's like, no, that's, right. it's not a real city. Right. Like, you know, but the because it kind of got too polished and that kind of exercise of that hoax that I was trying to perpetuate was too good. But like that face, because it's so bad, somehow I think I think it's better. Like I think it's like. You can recognize it. Yeah, yeah, it makes you. Aware. Things are messed up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's really impressive. Um, cool. Well, I think that's all the time we have. But okay. thank you. Really appreciate it. No problem. Um, and I would like to say that this uh, interview is uh, funded by the Gensler Exhibition Fund. Um, thank you very much. <laughs>